Chapter 2 Eason Every morning there is a choice to get up or not. That's my choice to go on or give in. And on most days recently, at least I get up and go on. But it's never going to be enough. Ever. I sigh, roll out of bed, and don't even wince when my foot hits the floor. The pain isn't so bad. Not anymore. Not enough to make me stop, and that's all that matters. I make my way over to the billowing white curtain separating me from the outside world, and peek past them for a moment before pulling open the sliding doors. It's 4am, relatively cool, and there's a breeze coming in off the ocean as I walk out to the terrace and lean on the railing. The moon is out, and it's good enough size so there's a nice carpet of light shining across the water. South Beach is almost always busy, but there's a lull around this time. It's not empty, not even now, but there is a small span of time in the early, early morning when it's nearly quiet and there's just the sound of the surf on the sand and the low murmur of a mostly sleeping city. I take a breath, go back inside, limping just a little, and then change into sweats in a tank. I mix a protein shake, stuff a water bottle in my duffel, and seven and a half minutes after I got out of bed, I'm pulling my front door closed behind me. I live on the ninth floor of a beachfront building most people would die for. And technically, I almost did die for it. It's been over seven years since my last ring fight, but the injuries linger, and they go far deeper than the foot. Was it worth it? Look around, Eason. Of course it was worth it. The money I have now doesn't really have anything to do with the fights. I had a little when things fell apart. Enough, actually, but not this kind of money. Wade, Davis and I, we stole this money. Technically, Wade stole it, but we divided it all up three ways and, well, we each got a lot. There was a last fight. It just wasn't in the ring. It was in Dublin, in my old neighbourhood, actually. But just when I thought the fight was over, some asshole came at me with a crowbar. He was going for the knee, but he got the foot because I was mid-kick. There was a moment there when I was on the ground when I thought, that's it, it's over now. You can let go, Eason. He brought that crowbar down on my foot three more times before Davis got him from behind and pulled him off me. Then, on one foot, I put that crowbar right between that man's eyes and we left. Actually, Davis and Wade had to carry me out, which was a little embarrassing. But everyone but us was dead, so I didn't really care. The foot, though. What a fucking mess it was. Couldn't walk. Not for months. Even though I had surgery and they put it all back together with pins and plates. These days, the foot is doing much, much better. It is. It really is. Well, Eason, some might say you're trying to convince yourself that's the case there, brother. But you're still fucking limping, aren't you? I got into the habit of talking to myself during recovery because I spent so much time alone. After I got out of hospital, I stayed in a private physical therapy resort in the Bahamas while Davis and Wade came to Miami to start a gym with the money we stole, which again, had nothing to do with the last fight. I didn't really plan on making Miami home. It was just close by. And where the fuck else was I going to go? Certainly wasn't going back to Ireland. Not after how I left it. So, here I am, seven years later. Still talking to myself, still dwelling on things I swear to God I'm not dwelling on. And I've still got no fucking clue where the hell I'm going in this life. Maybe nowhere. On that faithful day seven years ago we had a choice, Davis, Wade and me. There was a fork in the road, so to speak. But for me, the damage was done. And that fork really only went one way. They took everything from me. In a matter of hours, everything was gone. Not a single fucking reason to live. And you know what they say about men who've got nothing to lose. Well, I don't really know what they say, but I'm pretty sure it's got something to do with zero fucks. Davis owns two gyms. This one in South Beach, down the street from my penthouse where I train. It's a private gym meant for me alone. And another one across the bay where he sees actual clients. He was me trainer when I was part of the ring. Still is, I guess. Though there won't be any more fights. I could make a name for myself in UFC, maybe. Even with the foot. But there are no ring fights in my future, that's for sure. I have a sneaking feeling Davis only puts up with me these days because of the guilt. Which he earned. So I've got no thoughts about that at all. Wade was a paper pusher. Still is. And you might think he's got no place but guys like Davis and me. 
but it turns out an accountant with access to your owner's money comes in handy when said owner dies, and you're all the way across the world, safe and out the way, and you decide to steal billions of dollars from the Saudi royal family on your way out of a life of death, fight slavery. Yeah, Wade really came in handy. And that's when shit got interesting, to say the least. I don't really understand why I'm still alive, but I don't really care either. Zero fucks. When I come into the gym, Davis is in his office. I can see him through the glass. He's on the phone, so I don't bother him. I put my shit down in the locker room, then take myself and my wraps out to the training room, sit on a bench and go through the routine. It is a routine. Davis has been saying this for six months. You're just not invested anymore. The injury, all of it, has fucked you in the head. You need to retire or go all in, like Mars fighters. The cynical part of me understands that I'm his meal ticket. Davis has the other gym and he runs all kinds of classes, but he's teaching kids and middle-aged men who think they can buy their way into a black belt and wannabes who will never, ever make it. He's got no reputation in the real world. He's got no winners to show off because, obviously, he can't point at me and say, Look at our boy Eason here. Been fighting death matches since he was nine. Three turns through the ring, and I'm the one who taught him how to do that. No, he can't say that, can he? So he's stuck with me. Naturally, he wants to keep me alive. And professional fights, legitimate fights, are the way to do this. If I went professional, he could point at me and say, Look at our boy Eason here. Come to my gym and I'll turn you into him. Which would be a lie. There's no way to become a fighter like me unless you came up like me. But who cares? There's another part of me, the hopeful part, that wants to believe Davis actually gives a fuck about my future. I want to believe we're kind of like brothers. In it together. A team. I'm just not convinced. Davis steps onto the mat in front of me. You're never gonna guess who that was. I don't even look up. Just keep wrapping my hands. Max, remember her? I pause, still not looking up at him, and think back, placing the name. The Ring of Fire reporter? Yeah, her. What the hell did she want? Davis doesn't say anything for a moment. And then an idea hits me, so I look up, feeling more hopeful than I have in a long time. She's got a fight for us. What? No. He laughs, like what I just said was so stupid he might never get over it. I'm instantly irritated. The ring of fire was my life. Winning death fights was the only purpose I had. And then Court Van Breda and his little camp of murderous children killed a whole bunch of important people in some Brazilian jungle and it was over. Just like that. Over. Court wasn't supposed to win his last fight, and I don't really care about that part. I would have fought Pavo or Court. Wouldn't have mattered to me who won. The point was that I was next in the rotation. The winner of that fight was mine. I had everything on the line, literally everything I had left in this world, and Court Van Breda went and fucked it up with his dreams of freedom. I will never get over that. Ever. Then what the hell did she want? I'm squinting at Davis, getting angrier by the second. She's looking for a woman. Why is she calling you about that? Because this girl is one of Court Van Breda's child fighters. I stop scowling at him and just stare for a moment. Which one? Irina. Never heard of her. No, she wasn't in the Ring of Fire. Obviously, since she's female. She was only 13 when that whole shit show went down. But Max tells me that she was the one who took down Udolf that day. Loy. Max was there. She should know. Maybe. I mumble this, then go back to wrapping my hand. But when Davis remains quiet, curiosity gets the better of me. Why is Max looking for her? It's personal. That's what she told me. I look up at him and find him doing something with his phone, texting someone maybe. For a few years I wondered what happened to Court and Mart and Rainer. I heard rumours that they were running a supply ship. But then, one night, they were. Mart at least. On the fucking pay-per-view stream, having successfully transitioned his top fighters from the death camps into the legitimate world of MMA. He's got a world-famous gym down in Rio now. Fighters, top-notch, fucking fighters coming out his ass. He's got money and women and drugs. Maybe not drugs, but probably. And fame. Davis deconstructs each of Mart's fighters in every single event, so I've seen all the fights. The whole thing makes me furious but there's no way I can't watch them. I'm obsessed with all of it. 
the gym, the location, the guys. And one girl, though she's retired now, the contracts, the money, the fame, all of it. I've got most of that shit too, but he's still got his people. My people are gone. And maybe it's irrational, but I blame Court Sickheart himself for that. Still, this little twist in the narrative is interesting. Did she run away or something? Don't know. I just told Max the same thing you said. Never heard of her. But get this. While we're on the phone, she sends me a pic. It's of a billboard in Times Square. Then another pic, which is the same picture, but a different location. London. Then another. Paris. She sends me 29 pictures of billboards all over the world. They got one thing in common. This girl she's looking for. Irina did some modeling. Bathing suits. He pauses here to smile at me. You want to see the pics? Why would I? She's pretty. So? Davis gets frustrated. He's always frustrated with me. I know you're angry about how it all ended. And I can tell you over and over again until I'm blue in the face that it's all worked out for us. But you never seem to get past it, Eason. You need to get past it. Get past it? Get fucked, Davis. I get up, hands now wrapped, grab a jump rope out of the box and start skipping. Every time my left foot hits the floor, a sharp pain shoots up my leg, but I ignore it. I'm getting really good at ignoring it. Davis follows me, standing just out of reach of my slapping rope. My point is, I get you, Eason. I understand you and your... anger. And I think you should take a look at her. Then he holds up his phone, not really giving me a choice. Woman. That's a stretch. She looks like a teenager. I stop skipping and take the phone from Davis to get a better look. She's pouty and pale and blonde and thin, almost a cliché ballerina type. Long neck and legs, shadows on her cheekbones and clavicles. Her rib cage showing, but she's not wispy and soft the way ballerinas are. She's hard. Everything about her looks hard. Which is a contradiction because she has nice round breasts and even though there's almost nothing to her, I'd bet my life she's not any taller than 5'5 five five and doesn't weigh more than a book. She's got hips too. Not an hourglass figure. She's much too thin for that, but curvy in a way only teenage girls can be. The bikini isn't anything special. Pretty much the same thing you see all day on South Beach. It's black with gold fringe on the bra and completely useless for surfing or diving or anything actually. Which again is how South Beach rolls. She's got her jaw clenched, which is pretty hard to do as one pouts. Her eyes are ice blue and flashing anger. Like even if she wasn't getting paid to stand there and had nothing better to do at the time, she'd still be pissed off that she had to do anything at all. Some might see that as entitlement, but to me, knowing who she is and how she came up, it comes off as indifference, maybe even resentment. Like her little bag of fucks to give is empty as well, but the most incredible thing about this picture is a purple bruise. I squint, looking closer at her. Is that a black eye? Davis laughs. <laughs> yeah. I look up at him. Why the hell would they photograph a girl with a black eye? He shrugs at me. I don't know. It's... Then he frowns. It's what? It was a thing. A while back, though. What do you mean, a thing? What kind of thing? He stares at me for a moment, going silent. What? I'm getting annoyed. Why are you looking at me that way? I'm trying to decide if I should tell you this or not. I'm reading between the lines and the anger is building up inside of me, like lava bubbling just below the surface, ready to explode. Go on, Davis, say it. Milk carton kids. You ever hear that expression before? I have no idea what you're talking about. In the 80s, there was an awareness campaign in the United States. When kids would go missing, They'd put their pictures on milk cartons to spread the word. Sounds horrifying. It terrorized an entire generation of children sitting at the breakfast table eating their frosted flakes. Davis pauses to laugh at this. Sometimes I hate his fucking guts. So it stopped. Early 90s, maybe. But then, right about the time the milk carton kids were going out of style, another term popped up. Milk carton models. They looked like drug-addicted street children, mostly because they were. What do you mean? Talent scouts would pull runaway teenagers off the street, 
dress them up in designer jeans, and put their faces in the glossy magazines. They were always gaunt and tired looking, black circles around their eyes. They called the look heroin chic. But then people started condemning it, started asking questions about the kids. Where do they come from? Where were their parents? And about the money, too. So, almost overnight, the milk carton model suddenly and conveniently disappeared. I look down at the picture again. Despite the black eye, or maybe because of it, the picture is stunning. And even though there are three other people standing on either side of her, a boy and two more girls, it's her who makes you look twice. Not her tits, not her suit, not even those coltish racehorse legs. It's that bruise around her eye, that unmistakable imperfection, and the expression on her face, so fucking defiant, like she lost everything. Everything. It's obvious that the photographer wanted people to think she'd been battered, but she hadn't. I know this without even knowing her. She's not a victim at all. She's a fighter. Mart's fighter. And she didn't get that black eye from a drug deal gone wrong or a boyfriend with a wild fist. She was in a fight. I can't see the bruise very well, but it was a recent fight. Probably a street fight because if she had been in the ring, there would be a lot more evidence. A lot more bruising, especially on her legs, which are bare, of course. She's in a swimsuit. Everything about this picture says, I come from Mart. She's pretty, right? I'll send you the pics. I look up at Davis. When was this taken? Max said three and a half years ago. How old was she? Seventeen. I study the picture again and find a little cut on her lip too. Maybe she's not pouting. Maybe her lips are just swollen. She definitely looks seventeen, so that makes her twenty now. I glance back up at Davis and find him smiling. What the hell are you smiling about? I ask. I think we should look for this girl. Why would we do that? Because it's a connection, Eason. And you seem dead set on keeping that connection alive. This funk you're in, it's got to stop. You can't go on like this. I ignore that bullshit. We wouldn't even know where to start looking. And I'm not traipsing all over the fucking country looking for a stupid girl. I could put some feelers out. In fact, I said I would. According to Max, everyone has seen these billboards, so she's sending it out to all her contacts trying to find her. We haven't seen the fucking billboard, so that's not true. Actually, I have. Well, not the billboard. A poster on a surf shop window right up Ocean. Shut up. Swear to God, I was over there at the shops at Ocean and 15th just the other day, actually. And that poster caught my eye from all the way across the street. Shit, the fucking girl I was with even stopped to look. Apparently this pick is the most popular ad campaign that company ever ran, so they've been using it nonstop in different locations for years. Even though that bathing suit is so out of date, they don't even sell it anymore. I narrow my eyes at Davis. How do you know so much about this stupid picture? He shrugs and sighs out his words. <sighs> I don't know, man. It's kind of weird, right? Like fate or something. So why doesn't Max just call her agent? Why is she so hard to find? Max tried, but apparently Irina is not a model. Some free agent found her on the beach down by the pier, made an offer, took her to a studio, dressed her up, shot the pics, paid her, and never saw her again. I shoot him a look of disbelief. They took the pics here, in South Beach. Right? He laughs this word out. What are the chances she's a local? I scoff and look at the picture again. She doesn't even look American. No. Russian. So if the pics were taken three and a half years ago, why do they think she's still here? Davis shrugs. Good a place to start as any, I guess. I hand him the phone. Just let it go. Then I go back to skipping rope. Davis tries to get me interested in the conversation again, but I turn my back and keep skipping. I'm not in a funk. A funk is something temporary. Nothing about how I feel is temporary. Later, after training is over, and only because I have nothing better to do, I take a walk up Ocean towards 15th Street. It's busy with people and cars, yelling and laughing, bright signs everywhere, trying to sell you things that you don't need. Even though I own a penthouse here, I haven't made up my mind about South Beach yet. I do like the actual beach itself. I like to run on the wet sand at night. I like the heat here too. 
reminds me of Morocco, and even though I should never want to think about that place again, it's where the story of me really starts, so I can't just put it away like a piece of memorabilia. Sometimes I think that those first few months when I was running wild with the other homeless kids in the Medina Quarter of Marrakesh were the best days of my life. And other times it feels like the start of a never-ending nightmare. I was terrified nearly 24-7, but there were minutes sprinkled throughout those hours that were fun, filled with strange food and strange music, and that voice bellowing through the city twice a day that made me think about strange gods. There was laughter too. The other kids were tough, but so was I. That's why I was there, wasn't it? All of it, even the scary parts, was exciting. Because, of course, when you're nine years old and your father sells you to a bunch of strangers who take you to Morocco and you escape and hook up with a pack of feral children who have stories just like yours and they talk you into hiding in a truck on its way to Marrakesh where you live on the streets and steal wallets from tourists to survive, it's a temporary thing. It never even enters your mind that you won't be rescued. There must be some mistake, I remember thinking that. Surely Declan or Connor, who were both there when the whole transaction went down, will come and find me. I was the little brother after all. Back then I didn't really consider Owen the baby, though he was. He was only just one, and we barely took any notice of him at all. He certainly never went along with us and Da for work, but they never came, of course. There was no rescue. I'm still here. That's what I would tell my father if he was still alive. I'm still here, you fucking asshole. I'm still here. Anyway, I find the surf shop and the poster of the girl. Though I've already seen it, I can't help wanting to take a closer look. The shop is still open, though getting ready to close, I think. So I go in, make a deal with the clerk, and end up leaving the shop with that poster rolled up in my hands. Even though I blew a lot of cash in the penthouse, I still have way more money than I need and I'm not really the kind of guy who likes to shop. Never got the point of owning things the way Davis and Wade do. But they're American, and that's just how the Americans are, I guess. Probably the Irish are that way too, but I haven't been Irish for a very long time now. My point is that paying that clerk 500 bucks for that poster was no big deal. When I get back to me penthouse, I unroll the poster, grab some hand wrap tape, and tape the poster on my ceiling just above my bed. Then I lie down and just look at her. Irina. Mart's girl.